G'day everyone, this is Jackson Milan, the Wealth Mentor. And Sam Panetta. And we are back for some very important announcements. We've had a week off from Ask Ori as Anything, and uh, we are now back in our newly launched Aureus Studios. It's uh, very, very exciting. My dreams have come to reality. And my nightmares have come to reality. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're, we're here. We're in the new studio. I've been spending as much time in here as I possibly can so Sam doesn't uh, try and poison me when I'm not looking um, and close down the studio. But uh, I've, I've got Sam in here. We're here for Ask or Is Anything, Sam. I'm excited. This is the best day of my life. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to, to sharing this day with you. Look, the studio is a good idea. It gets us out of the office. We've got our own little private meeting room before now. I don't know if you guys know much about the lifestyle uh, working building in Brookvale, but it's essentially a shared meeting room that you book, uh, which is great, uh, but we're having too many meetings, which is a good problem to have. So we, we've uh, acquired this uh, little little uh, dungeon here and, um, <laughs> and uh, we've, we've doubled it as a meeting room and also, also as, our, as our little filming room. So we're going to be producing some content in here uh, such as uh, Ask Aureus Anything, uh, our live Q&A that you're watching right now. So first things first, what do you want to see us do with this, this kind of wall area back here, this window? Um, I was thinking doing some kind of brick motif. Um, Sam doesn't agree. Sam's a simple man. I think we should just leave it and keep our money in our back pockets. That's what I like doing. Uh, it's boring, but it does the job. We'd appreciate your uh, your insight. <laughs> give us give us your, your insight. No one's going to side with me on that, mate. Everyone likes their own love side. Of stars. It's, uh, we're here the 43rd episode of Ask Chris Anything, and we're at the start of December here. So we're only going to have uh, a couple more episodes uh, this year. If that, we'll do one next week. I don't know if we're going to do one on, on the last week of the year. I'm not sure. We'll see, um, we'll see, see how we feel, see how sunny it is outside. Um, and then it's going to be Christmas time. So this year has absolutely flown by. Uh, it's been a big year for, for us too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so we're, we're only launched stories at the start of this year. So there's been a lot of a lot of growth, um, a lot of growing pains that come along with it, but a lot of exciting stuff as, as we've been Our beards have grown too, which our, is phenomenal. Our, our beards are thicker than ever, um, which, is, which is fantastic. my achievements for the year. <laughs> have a thicker beard than I did the year before. <laughs> uh, so it's good. Yeah, it's been fantastic. So we're going to be enhancing the way that we deliver content. Uh, we'd really appreciate your ideas. What do you want to hear from us? Uh, what do you want to learn about? Uh, what do you want us to do? What kind of antics do you want us to get up to? Um, we've got the space now. We've got so much room for activities. Um, my mind's blown. I don't even know the amount of activities we can do in here. So um, <laughs> let us know uh, how, how you'd like us to, uh, to entertain you in 2019 and beyond. But now, let's get to the meat and potato, Sam. Ask or is anything, our weekly live Q&A. We cover off on current events in wealth, finance, uh, everything that's going to impact you on your wealth journey. Uh, we simplify it. Uh, we add in some witty dialogue and we help aid you on your journey in pursuit of financial freedom. If that doesn't sound uh, like something up your alley, what are you doing here? Look, m most of this money stuff's taboo and people don't talk about it so they don't understand it, so they don't achieve anything financially. So we poke fun of it and we do well. We do all right. No, that's not what we do. So that's the opposite of what we do. We help, uh, we help people learn about uh, financial literacy, financial education, the things they don't teach you at school. And this Ask or Is Anything uh, once a week for an hour is our, our, our vehicle to, to, uh, to educate people. To race in ourselves into your lives. Absolutely. And you can tell that Jackson has been on holidays for 10 days because he's super energetic. Um, I, I much prefer it this way, actually. He's, he's not allowed to go three months without a holiday again. Ever again. Ever again. I love that idea. I do this on purpose, so Sam sends me a home. <laughs> 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 All right, so if you guys aren't a part of the Wealth Mentor community, you need to join up. It is a free uh, online community on Facebook where we share uh, content, ideas, uh, you know, data, information that comes out about everything to do with business, property, um, uh, finance, money, any, anything that you can think of. Uh, it takes costs nothing to join. So join up. Um, we'll accept you if you ask to be invited into it. And it's, what, what are we, 1,200 members or yeah, something? 
Maybe and like we're going to be enhancing the way that we add value to that community moving forward. So we want it to be more interactive. We're going to be doing some more uh, some group coaching and some other ways of, of adding value in that community next year. Um, so make sure you get involved, get the most out of it, and uh, I'm sure you're going to have a, a phenomenal experience as a result. Um, so beyond that, we're going to dive in. Uh, first things first is the general advice warning. Everything we talk about is obviously general in nature, and so don't make uh, don't implement anything until you get professional advice first. All right. So the first article, uh, very typical, is house prices falling at the fastest pace since the GFC, uh, and they are. They are. They're they're well off. Uh, you know, more than ten percent since the peak. Uh, they're off in Sydney more than 1% just in the past month. And that's a lot because then you annualize that, that's 12% um, in, in 12 months. And we've been going for a little bit over uh, 12 months now. So it's uh, picking up. So the pace of how far property prices are dropping is increasing. So it's, uh, it's getting more violent uh, as time goes on. And for anyone who follows property markets, if you're looking in Sydney, in your local area, uh, you are seeing some really steep uh, discounts that have not been available for years. You're seeing some properties sell at what they would have sold at uh, in 2016 or even 2015. So there's some very, very good deals uh, to be secured by those who can get the finance and who can afford to, to buy these properties. Um, you know, next year, I might even have a crack at it because a lot of the houses that you're looking at that were, you know, two and a half million uh, 12 months ago are uh, two million now, or sub two million. So these are these are very very fancy homes that have dropped a lot of a lot of capital. Your lower end of the market still it's coming off, but it's holding up a little bit better because of first home buyers are, are holding that up. Um, but the, the funny thing is, is that it's practically contained to Sydney and Melbourne. These these housing price drops because that's where, it's where the most growth is. That's where the most growth is. It's where the property is most expensive, and a lot of it was driven by the availability of credit. So it was, uh, people were able to borrow large amounts of money because lending rules uh, were loose. Now that they're tight, people can't afford to borrow as much money as they would like. So it's really bringing down the the value of properties in these really you know sort of higher end areas of Sydney and Melbourne and. The, the funny thing is, is that you're seeing regional areas and you're seeing the smaller cities uh, of Australia actually still performing relatively well, but the TV is never going to tell you about that. That's that's the media's job. But it's, um look, I, I'm excited. Yeah. I quite like it. It's there, There's an opportunity for people who were priced out of the market during this last boom and full of excuses was why they're not buying property. The excuses are over now. Property is cheap as it's been in years. So... You've got to understand the economics of property. And and this is comes down to, to basic economics 101. Mm -hmm. That property is driven by supply and demand. So what we've seen is, for example, the we, we've seen over time that the, the top end of the market, so typically anything that's above a 30% uh, variance from the median house price. So let's say the average house price or property price in a suburb is 750,000 or 800,000. And if you've got a $2 million property, it's well above 30%. That's the higher end of the market. And those are the types of properties that typically tend to uh, get the most amount of growth at the end of the cycles. So they're the last ones to go. And they're the first ones to start coming off. And because of this, we've seen, let's say there's, there's 10 people in the market that had the, the ability to buy these types of properties, say 12 months or two years ago, there might only be four or five uh, people now that are in the same position. And because of this, the heat's coming out of the market, so there's less demand uh, in the amount of supply that is there. And then obviously vendors or people who own the properties are getting nervous. So this is two sides of the equation. If you're a buyer, as Sam said, there's opportunities. You have the ability to negotiate hard. Uh, you have the ability to get a, a really good deal. Um, and once again, there's lots of people who are sitting on the fence and saying, oh, well, if it's come off this far, it's going to keep going, so I'm going to wait. Um, you should buy property when it suits you and when you can afford it. Mm. So take this as an opportunity today. Um, don't wait too long because you might miss the boat. Now, the second side of things is if you've got a property and you're panicking uh, and you're saying, oh, the property market's going to continue to fall, the, and I've lost X amount of money, let's say you've got a $2 million property that people are evaluating it now, 1.5, 1.6, you only physically lose that equity if you sell the property. Mm. So this is a paper loss, it's like shares. Let's say you've got a share portfolio worth a million bucks, the GFC rolls around, that portfolio is now worth 600,000. 
the, that's a paper uh, value of that, that portfolio. The only time you'd lose it is if you sell it, you take the cash and then you walk away. So be mindful of how you modify your behaviours depending on what side of the equation that you're on. If you're a seller, great opportunity to negotiate hard. Sorry, if you're a buyer, great opportunity to negotiate hard. Mm. If you're a seller, really consider the motivations for why you're selling. Are you selling out of fear because of the fear of the market continuing to fall? Or are you selling because it's an opportunity for you to potentially sell your place and upgrade into a nicer place that you otherwise uh, couldn't have purchased, say, 12 months, two years ago? So it's really important you understand the economics and you understand the motivating factors that are driving you to make this decision. And here's the thing, right? This isn't an economic problem. So Sydney's doing fine. You know what I mean? Sydney's doing just fine. It's Melbourne is doing isn't just it? fine. Well, it is speculation to a certain degree, but it's finance and the availability of finance. So this, this correction has really been driven by uh, the powers that be, the regulators clamping down on the banks, the banks uh, squeezing up, not lending as much, uh, and people just cannot borrow the same amounts that they could have borrowed 12, 24, 36 months ago. Now, the thing is, a lot of these people are doing better today than they were one, two or three years ago. So it's not that uh, it's not that people aren't doing well. You know, if you're in Sydney, it's a bustling, growing city. There's a lot going on. Um, and it's, it's just, you know, so I don't want people to feel scared that there's some sort of economic crash happening uh, because that, that's not the case. Yeah, exactly right. So make sure you get educated. Uh, don't listen to the media. Uh, take what they say with a grain of salt. Um, there's plenty of high quality educational resources out there like CoreLogix um, and a number of, uh, of big uh, economic houses like Biz Shrapnel and a number of other uh, economists uh, and factual information groups that can help you make better decisions around your property. Mm -hmm. um, it's just all about getting educated and learning about the market. And even if you're not ready to buy right now, use this time in the market as a way to learn from experience. And as the old saying goes, um, if you don't learn from history, you're bound to repeat it. Um, so just learn from the history. We're, 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 we should be grateful uh, for these opportunities, mm. even if we're not leveraging them, because it gives us an opportunity to learn in, a, a, I guess, a, a market condition that most of us pretty much haven't experienced. No, well, that's not since GFC, so it's been 10 years. So a lot of people who are 30 years old today probably didn't care about property when yeah. they were 20, so they haven't paid any attention to and this And even stuff. in saying that, that, they're using the GFC as a, as a, as a kind of a benchmark that, that from, at the GFC was actually the, the end of the uh, the kind of period in which Sydney and Melbourne property had sat flat. Mm. And it was essentially from 2007, 2008, where the market actually started. It started growing. taking off because they were cutting interest so rates, stimulating the economy. It's probably not a great benchmark. Once again, this is how the media manipulates data and information in order to scare you and sell papers. So once again, by having that piece of knowledge of knowing that the market had actually already sat flat for about five years since 2003 uh, and was actually ready to go again, it's not a great benchmark uh, to, to base your decisions mm. on. So get educated, uh, learn more about the property markets, make decisions that are going to be best for you in your particular situation. And here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. I know we talk a lot about this, but this is an opportunity. This might be one of the best buying opportunities that, that people see again. Do you know what I mean? And when the market goes, when it starts going up, it's going to go. It's going to go. So the biggest mistake here is that if you're in a position to accumulate property at this phase of the market and you don't do it uh, just because you're, you're waiting for property prices to go up or you're, you're, you're scared or something like that, that's a mistake. Do you know what I mean? Because before you know it, by the time uh, by the time the media is reporting that property markets are doing well, uh, they're on their way. The horses the horses bolted, and you're going to be competing with all the bidders again. You're going to be competing with all the cashed up buyers, and you're back no different to the race that you were in a couple of years ago with Sydney markets going nuts. Hundred percent. So, what do you guys think about all those news that's coming out about the downturn in the property market? Is it something that scares you? Is it making you sit on your hands? Do you see this as an opportunity? Are you going to still try your best to continue to buy property? Uh, we'd appreciate your thoughts. Let us know what you think. Excellent stuff. Hello, Nonna and Nonna. They're, they're here. Thanks for joining hello, us. Hello, hello, hello. All right, so next one. Now, Nine reveals 92 redundancies in wake of the Fairfax Media merger. Um, so Nine Entertainment will make more than 90 employees redundant as it pursues efficiencies following the $3 billion merger with Fairfax Media. Now, this is extremely common. 
Um, when we look at big business and any uh, merger and acquisition that takes place, the, the typical reason why people go to or businesses consider doing a merger is on the basic premise that working together is better than working against each other. Mm. Each respective business has gone through a due diligence process where they've considered each of their respective strengths and weaknesses and they've come to a decision that working together as a collective group is going to be in the best interests of that collective group. Now, typically speaking, obviously uh, Fairfax has acquired, uh, acquired uh, Nine Entertainment. It's going to build it into their existing business, keeping in mind that Fairfax uh, is, is owned of all of the big papers, all these things. Um, traditional uh, news is transitioning to digital. So being able to buy an entertainment company with as much uh, scope and reach uh, that the Nine Network has makes sense. Now, typically speaking, when you make an acquisition of a big business, um, and there's another example we're going to talk about later, uh, you either pay a premium for it uh, because there is essentially tangible or intangible value that you're acquiring, or you buy it at a discount. And typically speaking, if it's a good strategic decision, most businesses are happy to pay a premium for it. So they've paid $3 billion for the merger. Uh, and in order to try and recoup some of their costs, Fairfax typically has all of their own resources, people they already work with, people they know that can execute on their vision and have probably been in, on board of that whole due diligence mm -hmm. process. So therefore, they don't typically need all of the same operational resources and people that are within that business they're acquiring. So it's very, very typical and normal for a merger and acquisition to go through a restructure of getting rid of uh, dead weight, trying to recoup some of their cash with the ultimate objective of getting back to their break even point of what they've had to invest to buy the business as quickly as possible. It sometimes seems cold, uh, and obviously this is something that uh, some news has come out uh, prior to, uh, to Christmas. Um, so it's one of these things that it, it sometimes seems cold hearted, but it's just business. Um, mm -hmm. You need to make the right decisions for your business. And when we're talking about business like this, where there's people that are very highly paid to, to crunch the numbers and work out what's best, um, then obviously there's been a lot of thought that's gone into chopping these 90 heads. Look, it's interesting, right? I remember when I was young and I, I was reading and I was first learning about business and, and money and all of that. And one of the things that I read was that there's no good or bad scenario, right? It's the scenario just is how it is. And let me, let me explain this. So when you're looking... Uh, at uh, and this was in uh, this was based on you know the American uh, style of things where a lot of the Americans were producing things and there was just mass cuts uh, to people working in factories and things like that and every time they would do that uh, they'd make these mass cuts to their businesses the share prices would rocket right so the 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 standard media uh, made it. Uh, seem to be a very bad situation. Mm -hmm. And for the people here that were made redundant or were, were, were sacked from their job, it is a bad situation. They've, they've got, um, you know, they've got bills to pay, they've got mouths to feed and, and all of that. So for, for those 90 people, it is a really bad, and their families, it's, it's a bad situation. But the reason when uh, there's this mass uh, cutting of, in, of staff that the share prices go up, because on the flip side, uh, it's actually good for the business and it's good for the health of the business long term. So depending on your viewpoint, it's either a very negative situation or it's a very positive. If you're a, a shareholder in these companies, then really it's a positive situation for you because the business is going to do better over time. And it sounds ruthless, but it's the nature of the beast. Well, here's some takeaways for you. So the, the Fairfax Group, in conjunction with uh, with Nine, has about 6,000 employees. They're only cutting Nine to do It's a very small percentage. If we look at, for example, GM, uh, General Motors in the US, they've proposed a restructure where they're going to be making 50,000 people as part of their workforce redundant. Mm. That's equivalent to the entire workforce of CBA Bank. Um, now, so let's talk about this from two perspectives. Let's talk about this from a business owner's perspective. As a business owner, you need to drive your business and get the right resources and people involved to execute on your vision. But when you go through your startup phase, your growth phase, and you start to get to maturity, you may not need the same level of workforce that you once had. So a restructure can actually help you add a substantial amount of value to your business. On the flip side, as an employee, if you're in a big business and there's a restructure that happens, or there's a merger and acquisition that's on the cards or that's been finalized, be mindful that you should be on the offensive. Look for opportunities to substantiate your value 
and make sure your managers know where you add value, that you're willing to be dynamic and look for new roles. Because there was 144 roles that were made redundant. However, there's only 92 people that have been cut in this situation. So there's opportunities for the right people to be reallocated. Mm. On the flip side, if you've been made redundant, if you've been with the business for a while, you're typically going to get a pretty decent payout. So try and use that payout to your advantage. Don't sit on your hands for three, six, 12 months doing nothing and just living on that cash. Use it as an opportunity to supercharge your wealth journey. Chuck it in your offset, invest it, and make it work for you. Go get a job straight away. That's money in the bank that you haven't had to work for. Um, you've just been given it as a gift, basically. Mm. Um, so these are opportunities. Um, and it's about how do you approach these opportunities the right way to be proactive instead of reactive. Mm. There's people who find a way. There's people who find an excuse. You pick one. That yeah. was inspirational. That, that, was, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was so inspirational. We're, right. uh, I keep the table. We, we, yeah, we're keeping the table, right. making the screen blurry. So, here's, here's the thing, right? Here's, here's the thing. Because most people are employees, right? Most mm. people aren't in business for themselves. So most people would see this as a, as a bad thing. Now, you imagine this, right? You imagine if the business failed and everyone lost their job. So how many staff did you say the company had? 6,000. 6,000. So if the business fails, all 6,000 people lose their job. 100%. So is it better for 90 people to lose their job and the business to survive or for 6,000 people uh, to lose their jobs and the business dies? For the so, greater good, right? For the greater good, you know what I mean? So we've got a good question here. This is a great question from Cameron. So, hey, lads, in your opinion, is it a good idea to get a positively geared investment with low capital growth that doesn't affect cash flow and hope to repay the loan in a short period in order to ascertain a good amount for a deposit on a house. Obviously, this is an avenue I'm looking uh, into um, assist in buying uh, my own property that's livable. Uh, there are other smarter avenues to get into the market that is more affordable. I love this question. It's a great question. Um, Sam, you start on this one, mate. So look, here's, here's the thing, Cameron. So let's say uh, that you do buy a cash flow positive property uh, that doesn't uh, have any capital growth at all, and you hold that property for five years, and every every week you make fifty dollars capital growth out of it. Right? Uh, sorry, uh, you make fifty dollars cash flow. So what happens if the uh, the the water tank breaks? Right, and it's going to cost you two grand uh, to to fix the water tank. That has just eaten up forty weeks uh, of your cash flow positive property. And let's say that this goes on and on five years and by the end of it you've paid the loan down a little bit let's say you you let's say you haven't had any trouble and you've managed to pay the loan down 20 grand um, out of out of the cash flow positiveness of the, of the investment now you sell the property you you take your your, your your costs out of it and you put some money in your pocket and then you go away and use that as a deposit to buy the next one now you need to think that hasn't really served you very well now, if you were to buy a high capital growth property uh, and it goes up in, you know, you, let's say you make a $20,000 loss over the five years out of the cash flow, but the thing's gone up 100 grand, then you're still $80,000 ahead. Um, and it's one of these things that it's very hard to get ahead by small amounts of money. It's very hard to get ahead at by $20 a week or $50 a week or things like that. Yet, in order to get ahead, you need to play with bigger numbers and you need to play bigger. And that's why most uh, most property investors will go for the capital growth because they know that over long periods of time, that's where the money's made. Yeah, here's the thing, Cameron. The issue with property is that you're already uh, behind as soon as you buy the property by mm -hmm. at least four or five percent. Because you've got about four percent in stamp duty. So let's assume you buy a five hundred thousand dollar property, you're gonna pay twenty K to the government straight away. Now, if you're a first home buyer, you could get some concessions, but if it is an investment, you're not gonna get anything. Mm. Um, so let's assume it is an investment, you're twenty K behind. If you're only gonna be making that fifty bucks a week, how long is it gonna take you to hit your break even point? So when you sell the property, you're probably actually going to be in a worse position after agents' fees, after stamp duty than what you started with. So if you're looking for ways to expedite your way of getting to your home, you need to define the home goal first. What do you need to spend as a minimum viable uh, strategy to buy a property that is not just gonna be scraping in, that's gonna serve you for the medium to long term. So once we do that, then we then reverse engineer it. We say, okay, Cameron, based on your current income, uh, what is the maximum amount of debt you can service today? Because as Sam said before, your ability to borrow is typically the biggest limiting factor. Yeah. 
So let's define that. Can, can you uh, substantiate the borrowing to actually buy that property in the first place? And then that'll either tell us, okay, Cameron, keep earning the same money that you're earning, you can do it once you save the deposit, or sorry, mate, um, you can't do that. You need to earn this amount of money, so let's put together a plan to help you get there. Mm. Second part is, we need to do a budget. How long is it gonna take you to save the, the money the old fashioned way to get your foot on the ladder for the property that you really want? And once we've been able to do that, scenario one, scenario two, servicing and deposit, we then ask the hard question. Are you happy waiting that amount of time in order to get your foot on the ladder? If the answer is yes, let's do it the old fashioned way. If the answer is no, there's other things we can be considering. There's other growth investments like index funds or managed funds where, for example, we can go buy a portfolio of blue chip Australian shares that pay you six to 7% fully franked dividends with no costs. There's no hot water systems that blow up. There's no washers in the taps that need replacing. There's no shazzes and bazzes that are gonna punch holes in your wall. Um, these are the things that you can avoid impacting your portfolio and you can have a suitable vehicle that's gonna help you get to your home goal. So this is just about changing the way that you're approaching this strategy. Have an abundance mindset, not a scarcity mindset. Most people do the most damage because of the fear of missing out. They're trying to find the, 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 the easiest and the most viable and, uh, option for them to get a foot on the ladder, feeling like it's going to help them get to where they need to go faster. But in most cases, it actually does more harm than good. So what I'd advocate, mate, let's take up a time to have a bit of a conversation and kind of walk you through this uh, and essentially just kind of work out a bit of a plan of attack. So at least then you've got a bit of a framework, a roadmap to support you in, in what you're trying to do. I'm going to give you a real life example, Cameron. I'm going to give you a real life example. So back when I was 18, I bought my first property. I was looking for a property around 300,000, all right? And I was looking at a unit in, in Manly Vale, so on the northern beaches of Sydney, uh, for about 300,000 that would rent for about $200 a week, okay? And I was also looking at uh, houses in regional areas of Australia uh, for about uh, 300,000 that would rent for about $250 a week, all right? So it, would, would, it had a higher rental yield, all right? It had a, it had a higher rental yield at the time uh, by buying the regional property than by buying the, the, the city property, all right? The high capital growth property. So fast forward uh, 12 years to, to 30 years of age. Now that regional property is still worth around 300,000. So it hasn't gone up in value very much because it hasn't been a demand in that area. Um, it's 12 years older, so it's an older house now, and uh, the rent is still around 250 bucks a week, okay? So that would have been a very poor investment, like I didn't do it. But on the flip side, the Manly is probably now worth the growth, and the rent, now is uh, well over you know, 600 bucks a week, all right? So it's now more than double what that other regional property is. So now after investing for, for 12 years and being in that one property, where's the best cash flow gonna come from? It's come from the capital growth property because as the, the value of the property goes up, even if the rental yield stays the same, it drags the amount you get rent up. And I've owned that property for 12 years and I've been able to increase the rent every year for 12 years on that property. And a regional cash flow property, can't you can't do that. There's not enough demand for it. And that's, um, you know, that's where, that's, that's where the magic happens. Mm. This is the economics of property, mate. So it's just about understanding all the different uh, avenues. And yeah, as I said, we can have a bit of a yarn about best, better ways for you to approach this so you can get your foot on that ladder. Absolutely. Hopefully that's a value, mate. Thanks for the question, mate. Cool. That's that's good. That's a good one. All right. So next, uh, I love this. Uh, you love this. This is the best. All right. There's a new place to lodge complaints about the banks, and it has already <laughs> been flooded. All right. So, <laughs> so there's it's just it, been me. <laughs> it's just Jackson just <laughs> trolling them. He goes to the Philippines and just rings up this. I've hired a team just to submit complaints on my bar. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. The, it's not a new, it is a new entity, but it, it's replaced three other entities, right? 
So it's essentially doing the role of what three different things used to do. Now, at first glance, I look at that, I'm thinking, you know, the Royal Commission and banks do heaps of really bad stuff. And some of the things that they've done are really horrific. Like they've treated, uh, you know, a widow uh, very poorly uh, and, you know, other people that, you know, they've lent more money to than what they could comfortably afford and, and all those sorts of bad things. But the surprising thing about this article, and you would not uh, know this by reading the headline, is that the majority, the majority of complaints were from people who couldn't borrow the amount of money that they wanted from the banks. So they bring up a complaint and said, the banks won't lend me the money. Now, these people, if they can't get the, the money from the banks, then it's, happy. look, it's one of these things that they're probably trying to borrow more than they can comfortably afford. Do you know what I mean? So it's they're protecting the banks are protecting these 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 consumers from themselves, and at, no one likes to be declined from a, from a bank application, and it can get emotional, and, and you can be frustrated by it. But having the overwhelming majority of complaints mm -hmm. being for that cause, I, I didn't see that coming, and it makes me it makes me really think. Do you Here's know what I mean? The problem, Sam. So I've spoken to a lot of people about this, and and this is the, one of the benefits of working with a broker. Now, if you go to a bank directly and submit an application and the application is declined, typically the generic response is due to bank policy, you have not offered credit at this time. Mm. And basically, the computer says no, see you later. And that's extremely frustrating because as a human being, we always want to know why. Um, if something hasn't worked, we want to know why. Um, and more often than not, if you're dealing with the bank directly, you will not get an answer. Mm. And what are you going to do? You're going to get shits. You're going to go into one of these, um, these complaint authorities, you're going to submit a complaint, uh, because not only did you not get the outcome, you weren't given justification. Mm. If you're working with a broker, like, once again, uh, we're not miracle workers. We work within the rules. And there's clients that come and submit applications to us that we're not able to be able to assist them at this point in time. Mm. The difference is we provide them with a, a justification as to why and a formal plan of what they need to do in order to facilitate and get the strategy done. So, for example, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Client, um, you weren't able to, be, to secure the finance to be able to buy your first home. The reason for it is that you don't have enough of the deposit. Um, so your current borrowing capacity is X. In order for you to buy the property you want at Y, you need to save X amount more money. And uh, as part of our conversation, it's probably going to take you about this many months in order to do it. Mm. So we can help you in terms of our wealth strategy, or you can go about it yourself and come back to us once you've saved that amount of money, and we can go again. So once again, the client might still be annoyed, but they now have an action plan, mm -hmm. and they now know exactly what they've got to do in order to turn that dream into a goal, and then turn that goal into reality. Uh, much like this studio set, we uh, we laid down the foundation, we put together the plan, we made it happen. And um, so uh, so yeah, look. Some people can't be helped. I've had people inquire for a home loan for me. They said, look, I don't work. I never worked for 10 years and I've got no money, but I'm going to buy a house. So I can't help you. No, no one is going to lend you money. Do you know what I mean? You need to have some sort of commitment uh, to actually uh, achieving these goals. And here's the thing. Any, any good broker will do the research before they submit an application to the bank. Um, and stop from butchering your credit file. The bank doesn't care. That's their, their policies. You're going to submit it. Uh, it's either going to work or it's not. It's no skin off their back. Do you know what I mean? Where a broker will only get paid uh, if something works. Do you know what I mean? So they're not going to they're not going to damage your credit file and, and waste your time. But um, I feel that there's a lot of anxiety towards the banks at the moment yeah, with the royal commission the case, going right? on. So here's the thing, when you're serving so many customers, you've got, for example, CBA over 50,000 staff, mm. things are going to go wrong. Um, I think it's, the banks do cop a lot of flack um, just because, but it's also extremely important there's the right reporting channels and consumers have the right level of education in order to not only know when they should make a complaint, but have the appropriate avenues in order to make and escalate complaints mm. against big beasts like the banks. So... I'm happy these kind of complaints are happening, even if they are for, for sometimes unjustified reasons, um, because it helps give us the opportunity to educate the consumers, which, to be frank, the banks aren't doing. Mm. Um, the banks are just doing the transaction, doing what they've always done, um, and kind of leaving everyone in their wake. Um, and once again, it's a double-edged sword. We've just got to be mindful that there's going to be both sides to, to the equation.
Well, we're lucky we have the opportunity to make complaints, do you know what I mean, and seek justice when things go wrong. Because it, essentially what's, what's happened in, in banking the further back in history we go uh, is that the smarter people would take advantage of people who weren't as financially literate as them, uh, and they'd essentially rape and pillage, and it would keep the rich rich and the poor poor. And, yep. and that uh, has changed over time as people have become more financially educated. Mm, yeah, so it's a good thing. What do you think? Um, do you hate the banks? Have you submitted any complaints? Um, if so, why? Have you ever submitted a complaint? Not against a bank, no. Um, I remember when I was younger, um, as most people have probably had a, a bad experience with a telecommunications company. Mm. So I submitted an app, uh, a, an inquiry to, to Foz uh, in order to, uh, what the telecommunications ombudsman, sorry, um, in order to, uh, to try and escalate uh, the situation and get an outcome. Uh, it was more a, a threat than anything. Did it work? I got the outcome, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, I don't know if I've ever complained about something before. You've got to pull some strings. Yeah, you've got to, you, you've I'm going to get simple, what you want. I'm a simple man, mate. All right, so next one. So Reject Shop uh, urges shareholders to reject global takeover bid. Hmm. So the Reject Shop, been around for Yonks, uh, essentially a, a, a retail store that sells uh, essentially cheap goods, uh, has essentially uh, formally rejected a takeover bid launched by the packaging billionaire uh, Raphael Jaminda, uh, calling it highly opportunistic. So it was basically a bid at $2.70 per share, uh, being mindful that back in October, they were trading at over $8. So it was around about a 70% discount to market value. Now, one of these things, if you're buying and selling shares on a publicly listed company or even an unlisted company, um, typically if we're talking about small volumes, it's gonna trade uh, at market, whatever the market is. However, when we're doing big takeover bids where there's a, a big player, um, in this case a billionaire that's willing to buy all of the shares, um, they have the ability to submit whatever offer they want. We've got to realise that a business is determined and valued by its intrinsic value and then there are multipliers, either as we spoke about in the past around the Fairfax situation, a, uh, essentially a, 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 a premium or a discount depending on key factors that are associated with that business hmm. and also who's looking to buy it. So in this particular case, uh, they're essentially looking to, to essentially throw out an offer to get a substantial discount to market. Now, it's a smart decision from my perspective, if, if it's the same situation like we're talking about the property market scene. Yeah. You've got somebody who's got money and is a potential buyer, obviously a billionaire, um, not short on cash, um, and is going to look to buy a business that they feel uh, using, a, I guess, a values-based principle, a, 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 a values methodology, say, so let's buy it at a discount and then have instant value back in the business by optimising it mm. moving forwards. So the importance of this and the significance of this is really a learning experience. I think most people overlook these things. It's pretty boring for most people other than us, right? Look, it is. It is. Unless you're a keen stock punter, uh, you're not going to get a, a big kick out of it. I just this. like the strategy around this. Well, it's it's funny that you mentioned it because 12, it is a 70% discount to the, the share price 12 months ago, mm -hmm. but it's actually a 20% premium to the share price today. So the share market has already punished the reject shop, and they're saying that that old mate has come out and said, look, this guy is drowning. I'll help you out, but uh, give me the cash, you yeah, see? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it, it is it is very opportunistic, but retail, what a tough industry. 100%. Well, it's cyclical. So we're talking about $78 million transaction potentially here. So when you think of it, it doesn't seem like a, that huge of a business for how long it's been around. Um, and I think it just goes to show that mm. traditional industry uh, has, has, is going to do it tough. Um, and this teaches us a couple of things. One, uh, opportunities are available to those who have the means to pursue them. Mm. Uh, two, when you're doing it tough, you may be forced to fire sell. In this particular case, obviously the bid's been rejected, but there's been plenty of other businesses who've seen kind of the, the, uh, the white flag being dangled and basically take the money while they can. And three, uh, that new age businesses, uh, technology driven businesses have typically shown that they've got much more capacity to generate and substantiate value uh, in a very short amount of time. Like we've got Australian billion dollar companies that exist that are purely technology driven. And we've got a company, how long has the reject shop been around? Thousand years. <laughs> Thousand years. <laughs> hey, look, 
I love those key takeaways. Like the, the average punter, what does this mean for the average punter? When assets are on sale, buy them. You know, property markets, we're just talking about them, very cheap. Share prices, sometimes they get smashed. What's the, what's the stats? One every, every four? One every four years is a, is a loss. It's a loss. Buy the shares when, when they're on sale. And anyone can buy property and anyone can buy shares. You don't need to be a business owner. If you are a business owner, the takeaway of this is understand the value of your business mm -hmm. and understand how to create value in a business and maybe what, what we considered valuable last generation or the generation before may not be valuable this generation, next generation, the one after so you really need to think about it you're right jackson there's there's companies out there that are just an app you know what i mean that are valued more the reject shop they've got they've got shops they've got you know, the full operation of the huge business. liabilities huge overheads do you know what i mean mm. so it's look it's an interesting thing maybe me and you should become an app we should we, we basically are an app <laughs> we're a walking talking bearded <laughs> app what do you think should sam and i become an app I wouldn't know how to become an app. I don't know. If anyone knows, I'd give it a crack. You let us know how we're going to become an how app. How do I evolve into an app? That's our final form. Do you guys take cues from these from these rich players, right? So there's these guys playing Monopoly on a very big scale, <laughs> right? Are you guys watching what these guys do and emulating it? You know, it, money hasn't been reworked for for years. It's been the same game for a very long time. So, you know, one of the things I'd done when I was younger was looked at what the rich guys were doing and essentially said, I'm going to copy them, guys. How'd the new boys go today? They're good. They're good. So I, uh, my my brother and my cousin, uh, my brother and my cousin Dylan are in the office on a, on a, on a two-week trial this, this week, they're next week. They're doing push-ups, they're doing burpees. They're, they're, doing all the, they're doing all the all the hard stuff to see, <laughs> see if they like it. No, um, they're a good bunch of lads. They're doing well. They're doing well. We, um, we had them making some phone calls today. Oh, yeah, that's good. Had to call some bankers to discuss bank policy. They were sweating, they were sweating bees, but that's all right. I remember my my first phone call. I was I was sweating too. So now I I call people at night when I'm asleep. I just you're so good at you it. You get used to it. It's been you get so used long. To it. Last time you fell off your dinosaur when you're making phone calls. Absolutely, I love that. All right, all right, we're off track. We're off track. So okay. Here's a question for you: If you were a billionaire, would you buy the reject shop? No, I don't think I would. I wouldn't know. No, traditional industry is dead. Things are changing. Things are evolving. In 80 years' time, reject shops are not going to exist, I tell you. I'd buy real estate. I would do what this next article is about. Sydney's King Street Wharf waterfront precinct sells for $125 million. It is a very good sum of money. It's a very good sum of money. And uh, we see uh, there's actually been a lot of like uh, massive sites, massive bits of real estate in Sydney CBD that have exchanged hands over the past few years, right? They've been a huge transfer of wealth. And here's the thing, right? This is the, this is the capital growth game in real estate. These are the, the best properties in Sydney. They're the best properties in Australia. And you've got to ask, how does a property get valued at 125 million, the amount of rent it would generate, and the amount of capital growth that's going to occur in the future is almost priced in. It's almost baked in. You've got to think, as long as Sydney does well, and as long as Australia does well, these properties are going to do well. And these, this is where the big players play. Well, here's the thing, mate, and this is something that I, I still need to wrap my head around. So they paid $125.5 million for a 99-year leasehold, because all of this is basically crown land. Yes. So what factors does that play? Look, because you don't really own the property. You've only got it for 99 years, don't you? Look, you, you don't really own the property, but they're essentially going to continue renewing the lease. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like a lot of the property in Manly, up in Manly Head, it's all church owned, it's all Catholic land. Um, and some of those properties go for 10 or 20 million and you don't ever own the property. You own the 99 year lease on it. Um, it hasn't seemed to slow the capital growth of some of these properties. Like some of the, the highest priced properties in Sydney are those, of, are those types of properties that you never own. Look, you never really own any property, mate. Someone it's a once, a piece of paper. It's a Fugazi, none somewhere. of it's real. Someone once said to me, they said, oh, once you pay off your home loan, you own your house. And then someone else said, stop paying your council rates for three months and then you'll see who owns your house. It's true, <laughs> it's, it's true, true. they'll throw you in jail. So it's all for Gazi anyway. None of it's real. Uh, if you can afford to buy uh, the, the King Street Wharf, 
buy it. That's you know, I, I, if I had a spare 125 lying around, I'd probably buy the wall. Well, here's the thing: there's been obviously a lot of things that have changed in the space. So there's the six billion dollar Barangaroo project mm. um, on the the King Street Wharf. There's like the uh, cargo bar. That was the old hunting grounds back in the day. <laughs> Subbies on a Friday night. <laughs> And uh, we got uh, the Malaya restaurant, all of these things. These are all big commercial properties. I think there's been over a billion dollars in retail properties change hands in the local areas uh, over the last few, uh, over the last year. So it's obviously a big space and, and commercial is interesting. Um, mm-hmm. The commercial space is probably more an in, uh, indicative of how the business environment is doing and residential is more around consumer and, and uh, household sentiment. Absolutely, yeah, I agree 100%, mate. 100%. So if these types of transactions are occurring, um, there's, there's huge amounts of property transactions that are changing hands, um, and obviously the amount of investment that's going into areas like Barangaroo, which are hugely focused on, on business and, and corporate, um, and of course uh, the supporting industries like your, uh, your, your uh, retail and, and, and uh, hospitality industries to support those businesses, then that's got to be a good sign for things to come. Absolutely, mate. Here's the thing, like a lot of these big businesses have to buy these sorts of properties. Like you imagine if they were buying residential properties, how many houses or how many units mm. would they need to buy to invest 125 million? It would take them years. And imagine managing it. It would, it would be a mess, right? So a lot of these bigger companies that have huge sums of money have to buy these very, very large properties um, because otherwise they, they, you wouldn't be able to operationally own that many properties. 100%. Do you know what I mean? I'd really be interested to, to see, um, yeah, because it's, it's obviously a private real estate uh, firm that, that has made this acquisition um, of what other types of, of commercial assets they've got in the portfolio to kind of just get an idea of, of what kind of play this is. Mm. So interesting. So question, what do you think uh, about these types of, of big land uh, or property acquisitions? Does it interest you? Um, what would you do if you had $125 million? Most people wouldn't buy King Street Wharf, mate. They, nah, they'd, they'd be done, I'll tell you. They'd, they'd just, be they'd, to the casino. They'd wrap it up. they go, look, 125 mil, I'm done. I don't want it. And it goes to show, like, like these people who, these people are obviously very, very wealthy individuals. Now, they, at 125 mil, they've got enough money to sort of pack it in, right? You know what I mean? They wouldn't have to work again. They could buy the reject shop. They could, change they could though, buy the reject right? shop. But the thing is, they're, they're still continuing to, to grow their wealth. And a lot of these really rich people, that's what they're like. Okay? They just continue. They don't need the money. It's just, it's more so the ambition that they're pursuing, right? Yeah, so we can talk about them on Ask or anything exactly about right. um, They love it. They're probably tuning in. Absolutely. Thanks for watching us. I hope you uh, you enjoy the, uh, the property. All right. It's, uh, we're, we're, we're done for the articles this week. Uh, we have 15 minutes left, so we're going to go through some questions uh, that our clients have, have poised to us over the past week. So if you guys do have any questions while you're sitting here, throw them out because we have 14 minutes left and at 6.30 we're done, we're going home. So you've got to ask the questions now. <laughs> you just need your question. I'm sure you have questions. <laughs> Maybe you just want to engage in the banter. Um, you know, Shane Black's not here. Shane, Shane, Shane Black, is. where's Peter? Curie. He was here and then he bugged off. Uh, really disappointed. There you go. That's all right. We can't please them all. But uh, let us know if you've got any questions, hit us up and uh, let's have a conversation. Otherwise, we're going to dive into the questions that we've got throughout the week. Why don't you have a, have a shot at that one, mate? I have a shot at, uh, at this one. So as a business owner, uh, when is it appropriate time to reduce my responsibilities in the business? Um, and should I think about adjusting my remuneration accordingly? So great question. So I've been having some conversations with a lot of my business clients around the, these types of things. Um, ultimately, as a business owner, you, you start a business because you ultimately want to be the master of your destiny. You want to be able to control your time. Uh, you want to be able to, to pursue opportunities that you otherwise couldn't if you were an employee. And there's always a, a kind of a, a vision of an end game. I'd say the majority of business owners just never get there. Um, most of them are still technicians in their business until the day that they pull up stumps. But there are a, a few that get the opportunity to be able to phase themselves out. This is great. Um, this is not about making yourself redundant uh, and going and sitting on a beach. Most in entrepreneurs and most business owners that I've spoken to have no ambition to do that, um, but they just want to have flexibility to do more things that they enjoy. So there's a couple of ways you can approach this. One, you can transition yourself to being an investor or being an advisor. Now, typically speaking, um, you need to be able to replace yourself in the business, get a managing director, get a general manager, get somebody into the business that understands the business inherently, has the ability to assume your position, and is typically going to take 
uh, some of the, uh, the remuneration uh, or, or uh, will have a package that's going to be uh, essentially rewarding them for that effort and expertise that needs to be exercised. Is it 150 grand, 200 grand, 300 grand, whatever the number may be, typically depends on your business. Now, what that typically means is that you then go to a point where you draw a dividend. Um, you are typically maybe receiving a, an advisory salary for whatever time is taken for sitting on the board and you take dividends or profit at the end of the year. The other way, and I guess depending on the size of your business, and typically speaking, let's assume you've got a really phenomenal business, you're making 20% um, or 30% profits. Um, if you, depending on how much you earn, do the numbers. Uh, if you're making 20% profit, so let's assume you've got a million dollar business and you make 20 grand a year profit, after you pay your taxes, is that enough for you to live the lifestyle you desire? And what happens if the, you have a bad year in, in the company? Um, is that going to affect your ability to live the lifestyle you want? Because obviously that's a variable income. You only get paid if the business is profitable. Mm. So you really need to consider that. The other way is about adjusting your duties. So can you come uh, become some way of a, a passive uh, CEO where you drive strategy, uh, you drive the direction of the business, you work on work on the business, um, of continuing to drive it and move it forwards, um, and then continue to take a salary and of course get the dividends at the end of the day. So that would be the way that I'd prefer to approach it if it were me, uh, because once again, your business needs to be in a very particular position to be able to just to survive on the uh, on the dividends uh, from that business. Um, and when we're talking about a timing, if this is a question that's coming up now, I'd expect there's probably something on the horizon in the short to medium term that you're working towards. Mm -hmm. So you may, may not be willing to wait long enough to get your business in a position where you could just live off the profit. What do you think, Sam? I think, I think you need to segregate yourself as an employee working in the business and an owner of the business. So I think being an owner of a business, you should be entitled to the dividends and the profits. Uh, and I think that as an employee of the business, you should be remunerated for the amount of work uh, and value that you add to the business. So you need to think if uh, you're, if, if you pay yourself a $200,000 in your salary uh, and then you've decided you're not going to work anymore, uh, but you're still going to pay yourself a 200 grand a year salary, yeah, would you pay someone else 200 grand a year to do that job that you're doing? If the answer is no, then you don't deserve the 200 grand. Um, if the business is making 200 grand a year in profit uh, and the whole show runs itself and you want to take your 200 grand and go sit on the beach, take your 200 grand and go sit on the beach. So you need to di differentiate between yourself as an employee and yourself as an investor. Uh, and it's it's true. That, it's, that's like the dream land for, for business owners. Do you know what I mean? That's what people are striving towards. It's what they want to achieve. 99% uh, of business owners never achieve it. Mm -hmm. Um, but you, you have to work towards it. Hundred percent. You have to work towards it. And look, like one of our mentors, Dale Beaumont, he takes four months off a year, mm. um, where his business actually grows in his absence. So he takes four months off a year, completely disconnected from the business, um, and but really still enjoys being in it and doing what he does every day for the time that he's there. But he's got the the ability to spend that much time out. Mm. I think for most business owners. You want to be connected to your business and obviously still have that passion and be able to, to have something that you're working on that gives you fulfillment and gives you purpose. But then having four months where you can do whatever you want, wow, that's 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 pretty cool. That, that's enough. Like uh, for me, that's enough. Two months on, one month off. I think he was saying that um, the two months on he works hard. Yeah. And the, the one month on, I think he was saying he does an hour a day mm. uh, on his laptop. Nowhere in Australia, he's some overseas traveling. But that's look. If you could do that as a business owner, if you can it's achieve phenomenal. that, then that is a phenomenal result. Um, I don't know if any business owner uh, who is that ambitious can go really, really hard, grow the business, and then just pull up stumps. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. not in your it's nature. It's always going to be something that you're going to be pursuing. You're going to be a side hustle or something. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, look, yeah, when is it appropriate? Depends. When the numbers are justified, I'd say. Yeah. Because obviously you don't want your business to burn into the to, to fucking to crash into the ground and you <laughs> come back to nothing. And there's nothing there. There's the nothing business there. is gone. No. The business is gone. And all that hard work for nothing. It makes me cringe. Mm. All right, over to you, Sam. All right. So uh, this is this is one that I've got a little bit of lately, mm. uh, and it's hugely concerning for me. So the question I got was, I bought an off-the-plan property and I can't get finance. What should I do? Um, you, you need to minimise damage at this point. So first of all, if your bank has said to you that, sorry, they can't do it, you need to 
extinguish all options, all right? So you need to go speak to a broker who has access, not a broker that's got access to four banks. You need to go speak to a broker who's got access to 60 different products or more, um, or vendors or more, uh, to see if there is a solution, because if you can't settle the property uh, of your deposit, uh, and then if the property is falling in value and it's on sold, you could be up for the difference as well. Uh, and you're gonna be in a little bit of trouble. So let's say you bought a $500,000 property, you put a 10% deposit, that's 50 grand. And let's say the vendor then went and sold uh, that property for 400 grand, so 100 grand less than you were gonna pay for it. Uh, you could be up for that 100 grand as well. So you could be down 150 grand. And for, for, for some people, uh, most people, that would right. ruin them. That's, that's send, that would send you broke. So it's one of these things off the plan. It's, it was great when the markets were going up. Mm -hmm. Now that markets are coming off and lending's tight. It's, uh, it's always been an area that I've been really cautious uh, about being involved in. Uh, and I'm still cautious and I probably always will be cautious about off the plan because, you know, maybe every two out of 10 can't settle, but that's two people out of every 10 that are just burnt, like really bad. You know, I've, I'm working with a client at the moment. Um, he's, it's not going to be able to secure finance, um, and he's he's already made the decision to to pull out uh, of of the purchase, and he's been saving up for this deposit for years. Um, and not only now has he lost his deposit, uh, but he's going to be up for another uh, X amount as well that he has to actually he's going to get sued for for the rest of the money. And this is just you need to, you need to get advice around this stuff. You can't just you know, go to a seminar and buy a property at the back of the room uh, because the guy had a really nice suit on and he, he sweet talked you. you. You have to get advice. You have to see if you can afford to borrow the money. Just because you have a 5% deposit saved in the bank does not mean that you can buy that property. It's enough to exchange on it, but it's not enough to buy it. And it's, 100%. Look, yeah, it's it's scary. Extinguish all options. Yeah. Chat to a mortgage broker, extinguish all options. If you cannot get finance and you really can't, work out what you're going to do next to minimise loss. And don't bury your head in the sand. So you need to be proactive. So the more time you've got, the more options that are available. Now, although the developer has every right to exercise those options and take your deposit to see the difference, they're typically, I mean, in some, some cases, they're going to potentially waive some of those rights if you do the right thing by them. This mm. is a two-way street. This is a business transaction. So try and approach it the right way with courtesy. Um, and if you give them time, you're open and honest, um, you, can, you can potentially negotiate your way out of some of these, uh, the, these potential damaging uh, clauses that could send you broke. So exercise all your options, speak to the agent or the developer, or whoever you're working with directly to explain to them the situation and keep them updated through every part of the, uh, of the process and just ask them for what options are available for you to exercise and how you can try and find a mutually uh, beneficial situation where you can minimise collateral damage. Mm. Um, and look, there's scenarios where we've had clients who've done this, the, the person who's been representing them has just found another buyer, that buyer's been willing to, to uh, buy at exactly the same price that they'd originally agreed to, and then the developer's been nice enough to refund the deposit as well because then they haven't been out of pocket for anything. So the only cost to the client was funding the legal fees associated with that process, so they might be down five grand. Um, whereas as Sam said, the worst case scenario, you could be up for hundreds of thousands of dollars and it could put you into a position where you have to, to default, you have to declare bankruptcy. It can be a horrible, horrible situation. So just make sure that you, uh, that you get advice, you be proactive mm. um, and, and approach it the right way. Absolutely. It's scary. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, good segue. What have we got here? So. Um, should I balance transfer all of my debts to avoid paying interest? So, look, I've spoken about this in my book, um, and the, I'm, I'm a believer that you should, if you've racked up bad debts, um, you should pull your socks up, uh, you should knuckle down, and you should go about it the old-fashioned way. Um, the reason for it is because this is about creating the behaviours and creating the habits to force you ever doing it again. But the issue is, and one of the common themes that I spoke about throughout my book, is that people don't know how to defer gratification. It's the reason why they've used credit in the first place. It's the reason why they haven't saved the money to be able to, to achieve the goals that they want. They're just expediting the process. 
and by balance transferring to a 0% and, and essentially forgetting about it for the next 12 or 24 months uh, is only adding fuel to the fire. So there is a caveat to that. First things first, do a budget, understand your surplus, set a plan for how long it's gonna take you to extinguish your debts the old fashioned way. Step two, set up a budgeting structure where you make your credit cards completely redundant. You don't use them as part of your, mm. your, your daily, uh, weekly, monthly circulation in terms of running your household cash flow. Start using your own money. Step number three, prove to yourself that you can create an emergency fund to fall back on in the event of the unforeseen car needing maintenance, um, engine being replaced, even going overseas, whatever it may be, build up that buffer. And then once you've been able to prove those three things, then you can potentially look at expediting the process of, of cutting up the card, doing the balance transfer, cutting up that card, and then converting all of that additional surplus to smashing it down as quickly as you possibly can, ensuring that you continue to follow steps one, two, and three. Only in this situation will I advocate it and any clients we speak to about this have to prove that they can walk before they can run. Um, it's not going to be a go-to strategy uh, because once again, we need to modify these behaviours to break the habit um, because too many people are just uh, are essentially working on, on borrowed money. They spend more than they earn and if, if you spend more than you earn, you will always you struggle. You will always struggle. So it's one of the, the core things that, that we look at is uh, cash flow management and nailing that. That's, that's, that's step 1A, that's the building 100%. block. You've got to have the, the behaviour and it's about setting up the right structure. I've worked with over a thousand clients and implemented our, our proprietary budgeting structure that's changed the lives of these people. Mm. Um, that's helped us get to a point where we've been able to help our clients build over a billion dollars in wealth. And all of it comes down to cash flow. It's about how do you convert your earned income into income uh, generating assets and compounding assets that work while you sleep. So. That's good. I'm, I'm, I can't add anything to that. That's, that that's, you, you need to watch the replay. If you want to answer that question, just listen to that again. This is not permanent repeat. Just yeah. Time. We'll make a CD out of we'll it. We'll be a bestseller. Yeah, it'll be a cassette. We'll put some Christmas jingles in the background and we'll sell it for Christmas. I love that. It's yeah. the best. I'll put, put it on our app. It'd be great. We'll put it on our app. We'll put little maybe decorations in our beard. It'll be phenomenal. Yeah, I don't mind that idea. It's good. All right. So we've got one more. Oh, no, we're done. No, we're, we're done. Six, done. Six, we're six, we're 6.30. We're done. We've had so we're much fun. Done. Jackson's had so much fun. He wants to keep going. Oh, what actually I do? Let's go. Let's make this two hours. Man. We're not going to make this two hours. I'm... We, I'm not going home. Neither of us are going home. You I've need got, to go on holiday. I've got about two hours. Next, next year I'm going on holiday. I'm going on holiday this year. I'm going grey. Look at me. Look at me. He's had enough. All right, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed Ask or Is Anything. Um, if you're watching this once we go offline, post your questions in the comments. Uh, otherwise, we will see you same place, same time next week for Ask or Is Anything. Thank you very much, guys. Catch you later.